Next, we have Dr. Abu Sebastian on the line. So he'll be delivering a talk on in-memory computing. Uh, and about uh, Dr. Abu Sebastian, so he received the BE Honours degree in Electrical and Electronics Engineering from uh, BITS Pilani and MS and PhD degrees in Electrical Engineering from uh, Lo uh, Loa State University. Uh, since 2006, he's, um, uh, he's a staff, sorry, he's a research staff member at IBM Research Surit Switzerland. He was a contributor to several key projects in this space of storage and memory technologies and currently manages the research efforts uh, in in memory computing at IBM's uh, Research Surit Switzerland. In 2015, he was awarded the European Research Council Consolidator Grant uh, in 2020. He was awarded an ERC Proof of Concept Grant. He was named Principal and Distinguished Research Staff Member in 2018 and 2020, respectively. In 2019, he received the Ovlensky uh, Lectureship Award for his contributions to phase change materials for cognitive computing. And over to you, Dr. Abu Sebastian, for your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chitra. Thanks for the very kind introduction. And I would also like to thank the organizers, in particular Alex, for the kind invitation. Um, uh, right. So today, uh, I was trying to think about talk about in-memory computing, and then I saw that there were quite a few talks, uh, you know, uh, on the on the topic. So I thought I would uh, focus my attention on uh, some of the work that we've been doing, um, mainly aimed at deep learning uh, and variants thereof. So that would be the the idea today. Uh, so this is how I would like to structure today's talk. So essentially there are three parts. So the first part is a very small one where I would like to briefly introduce uh, deep learning and in-memory computing. And then we move on to the, the second part where uh, we talk uh, a lot about, a little bit more about uh, how we do deep learning based on computational phase change memory. This is the bulk of the work that we do here in Zurich. Uh, and then the final part, which is a bit more forward looking, where we look at some of the applications that go beyond conventional uh, deep learning. Um, right, so uh, deep learning, as you know, uh, you know, had pretty humble beginnings. Uh, so in 1943, Warren McCulloch, who was a neuroscientist, and Walter Pitts, a logician, they created this very simple mathematical abstraction of a, of a single neuron. Uh, the soma of the neuron is uh, represented by a node that receives uh, logical inputs via the dendrites and aggregates them. And based on this, a, a decision is made. So essentially a very simplistic model that captures just the essence of what a biological neuron does. Uh, in subsequent decades, of course, came, you know, uh, uh, multi-layer perceptrons and uh, backpropagation and so on. Um, and, but then there was this huge lull, right? So around uh, uh, one or two decades back, uh, everything kind of uh, froze uh, and, but, you know, people are waiting for the hardware to come along. Um, but eventually we had enough uh, compute power and the viability of data to also make uh, neural networks work in reality. Having said that, it was it was a sudden development. Even in the early 2010s, uh, artificial neural networks were so unpopular that they were kind of getting dropped off the curricula in major universities. Um, but with the famous ImageNet contest in 2012, everything changed. Um, and at present, uh, the deep, deep artificial neural networks, the deep learning, um, uh, have come close to or even outperform human beings in, in many cognitive tasks, uh, such as image and, and speech recognition. And currently, I would argue that uh, deep neural networks are the, are the mainstay of the AI portfolio of, the, of, the, of almost all the major uh, IT companies doing things anywhere from translation to search ranking or providing news feeds and, and whatnot. So the, the bottom line is that you know, deep learning is here to stay and uh, you will see deep learning in either in its pristine form or you know, many variants of it, some of which we'll talk about even later in, in today's talk. Uh, but clearly, deep learning has this uh, computational uh, problem, which is computationally very intense. Uh, it takes days, if not weeks, to train uh, state-of-the-art deep neural networks, even with the most advanced computing uh, hardware out there. Um, and the power consumption uh, is, is kind of you know, highly undesirable. 
and, and many accounts unsustainable. I mean, you have probably have seen articles like this appearing in the past where they show uh, you know, deep learning in particular being a threat even to the, to the climate, right? So this is kind of the situation where we are in. Um, and uh, if you look at uh, how much uh, deep learning is getting incorporated in uh, the edge and end device applications, including the kind of applications that Vasco was talking about, uh, you know, this is even prohibitive to have this kind of energy consumption when it comes to uh, deep learning. Uh, so this has kind of woken up uh, computer architects, right? So they really have woken up to this challenge. Um, and I would uh, argue that deep learning is probably one of the key drivers uh, for innovations in the field at present. Um, and if you look at a, a computing system, so part of the innovations can be just trying to improve on the conventional general purpose computing system. Uh, for example, you could always introduce new forms of technology such as you know, the so-called storage class memory, you know, which is kind of this non-volatile DRAM. Um, you know, and you can also potentially try to introduce concepts as near memory computing, you know, try to perform a bit of computing uh, right on the memory chip. Um, so these are all things that you could do on the on the general purpose computing system side of things. Uh, but the most active area of research uh, right now is in the so-called standalone accelerator space, where you would like to optimize the computation and the data flow to achieve very high efficiency and throughput. And this is kind of what every single uh, IT company and non-IT company like the Amazons of the world are trying to do, right? Where they try to uh, kind of make the most out of the von Neumann architecture by kind of uh, designing everything um, very specifically for accelerating neural networks. But this approach is already uh, strained, given that you know, we are kind of living through the waning days of, of Moore's law. Uh, moreover, the, the key reason for why uh, deep learning is computationally inefficient is a need to shuttle around millions of synaptic weights during the computation. And this kind of uh, is not fully addressed uh, in, the, in this form of uh, approach. Uh, so this has uh, prompted research on genuinely non uh, von Neumann accelerators with uh, co-located memory and processing, and that is where in-memory computing come into play. And it is, I would argue, it is one of the most prominent approaches uh, in this direction of trying to um, uh, make uh, neural networks more efficient. Right. So what is uh, in-memory computing? Uh, so the essential idea is instead of uh, shuttling around the data between the processing and memory units as in a conventional computing system, uh, we would perform the computation in place in the memory itself, right? Uh, so that what you see on the top is kind of like a conventional von Neumann approach where you have processing in one side and the, and the memory is, uh, is, is sitting elsewhere. And then during computation, you need to keep shuttling them back and forth. Uh, but the question is, okay, but in the, in the bottom, you see how in-memory computing happens, whereby the computation is happening all by itself, you know, in the memory itself, without having the need to move it into the processing unit. Now, the question is, okay, how, how is it achieved? It is achieved by exploiting uh, in tandem the, the physical attributes of the memory devices, their array-level organization, uh, the peripheral circuitry, and so on. Uh, so it can be kind of viewed as a subcategory of the so-called the broader field of processing in memory uh, that also uh, includes the so-called near memory computing. Right. So in near memory computing, you have memory sitting there and you have some logic blocks right next to the memory. Uh, but in memory computing, uh, you are kind of collecting, uh, collectively computing on the memory itself. And that is kind of the key distinguishing feature. So I would say that the, you know, the key distinguishing feature or the litmus test for in memory computing, uh, say in contrast to near memory computing, is that at no point during computation, the memory content is read back and processed at the granularity of a single memory element. You are not reading back the memory and then processing it, but rather you are collectively computing on the memory itself. Um, but all of them fall in the category of uh, processing in memory, or some people call it comp computing in memory. So naturally, uh, you know, memory is at the heart of in-memory computing. So, so far, you know, in, the, in the conventional picture, uh, memory is just a place where you store your data, whereas uh, here memory is like an active participant of the computational process itself. Um, right, so um, uh, in, in, in recent years, uh, in-memory computing has been uh, facilitated with both uh, charge-based memory devices uh, like SRAM and DRAM, as well as uh, resistance-based memory devices, uh, but by exploiting uh, different physical attributes. You know, you could argue that in the charge-based memory devices, you are mostly relying on charge sharing, Coulomb's law, whereas in the resistive memory devices, you are mostly relying on Ohm's law, Kirchhoff's law, and so on. Uh, 
uh, there was this very nice review article uh, that we wrote um, early last year, uh, which kind of summarizes the whole field and gives a very good introduction to uh, you know, the, the device side of things and also some of the broader applications of in-memory computing. Uh, but today I would talk uh, mostly about the, uh, the deep learning application for in-memory computing. Right, so let's look at uh, a bit more detail into how we do uh, deep learning based on, uh, in this case, computational phase change memory, uh, just as an example. And that's also, as I said, one of the uh, main activities that we pursue in my group uh, here in Zurich. Um, so what are uh, phase change memory devices? So these are, um, uh, you know, uh, these are uh, based on the property of uh, certain compounds of uh, germanium, antimony, and tellurium, whereby they have drastically different electrical and optical characteristics depending on their atomic arrangements. Uh, in the disordered amorphous phase, they have a very high resistivity. And in the ordered crystalline phase, they have a very low resistivity. Now, if we sandwich this uh, tiny volume of material between two electrodes, uh, we can make a memory device. So by applying a voltage pulse and subsequent joule heating, the material can be reversibly switched from the crystalline phase to the amorphous phase. And now depending on the phase configuration, the device will have a different uh, resistance value. And this difference in resistance can indeed be read back by biasing with a small amplitude read voltage, which doesn't alter the, the phase configuration of the material. Um, so uh, just to give you an idea of the dimensions, the bottom electrode of this uh, mushroom type PCM device uh, is something like uh, 20, sorry, uh, the, the radius is 20, something like 20 nanometer. So it's a very tiny nanometric volume of material which you are uh, switching back and forth. Uh, it is thermally done, right? It's joule heating um, uh, and you can switch them back and forth uh, in this particular manner. So it's, it's one of the uh, resistive, one of the most prominent resistive memory technologies. I mean, uh, you might know it from the 3D cross-point memory, for example, right? And also there are also a lot of embedded variants of it. it's a commercialized technology. Um, and uh, I must also argue that this is, you know, just one among the several resistive resistance-based memory devices that could facilitate in-memory computing and could be deployed for uh, deep learning acceleration. Now, uh, so what are the key attributes that facilitate deep learning acceleration? Um, in my mind, there are two of them. So one of them is the so-called uh, analog storage capability. Uh, just the mere fact that you can have, uh, you know, a continuum of analog conductance values stored in a device. So if you look at a PCM device, um, now if you apply uh, suitable electrical pulses, we can achieve uh, intermediate phase configuration. In the beginning, I said, you know, you can switch from crystalline to amorphous, but in reality, you can actually get a, a, a get an intermediate phase configuration as shown here, where we modulate the size of the amorphous region. Uh, and in this way, we can achieve a, a continuum of resistance uh, or conductance values. So this is what I would call the analog storage capability. And for that, typically we use uh, a pulse of different amplitude. Uh, that's, that's what we typically do. Now there is another um, a property, which is a bit more subtle, that's the so-called accumulative behavior. So here the idea is that you start from a fully reset state, which is fully amorphous. I mean, this is kind of the kind of the fully amorphous state that you can get in a conventional mushroom, state, a mushroom device. And, and from there on, by applying a sequence of crystallizing pulses of the same amplitude, uh, then we can progressively uh, you know, crystallize and achieve a lower resistance values or higher conductance values. Right. So I hope you understand the difference. In one case, you are changing the pulses and you're trying to achieve some uh, analog conductance value. But in the other case, you need to apply the same pulse over and over again, uh, and you are able to change the conductance. Uh, so this is kind of uh, what I would call an accumulative behavior. It's sort of like a non-volatile integration, right? It's kind of counting the number of pulses during this process. So essentially we have this non-volatile integrator or counter of programming pulses. And that's what I would call the accumulative behavior. Now, these two attributes, namely the analog storage and activity behavior, uh, you would see that will serve as the basis for deep learning acceleration uh, using phase change memory. Now, also note that any other memory technology that exhibits these two attributes are also viable candidates. It's just that all the concepts that I mentioned here are equally applicable if you can come up with a, a device X, which has these two uh, properties that you can identify in the lab. Um, 
so now how do we um, um, so how do we realize or how do we do deep learning so i think this slide is kind of the most important one right so uh, essentially as i said there are two properties one of them is the analog storage capability and then the community behavior and and these are the two attributes that you use to emulate the synaptic elements in a neural network i mean already from a very rudimentary knowledge about how biological synapses work uh, you know that you know synapses are essentially connectivity with varying varying conductance varying levels of conductance right uh, and um, so and what you can see here, for example, uh, in the on the left side is one of the properties that that you would call synaptic efficacy. Uh, so this is just a weighting property, right? Suppose you have a uh, one layer. I mean, you can easily see that uh, if you just organize an array of PCM devices in a crossbar configuration, that is already implementing one layer of a neural network. Uh, so these are, let's say, the presynaptic neurons, and these are the postsynaptic neurons. And you would like to weight the signals coming through the presynaptic neuron by a certain conductance value and then feed that into the postsynaptic neuron. And that's precisely what this does by virtue of uh, Ohm's law and Kirchhoff's current summation law. Uh, and all you need for this is the ability to tune the conductance of these nanoscale PCM devices to a certain specific analog conductance value. So in order to implement synaptic efficacy, all you need is the analog storage capability. It doesn't care for accumulative behavior, right? Because you just need to be able to tune these conductance values in an analog fashion and then fix it there. And thereafter, uh, uh, this operation can be done. This is what you call the synaptic efficacy, uh, and this can be done. So for inference, as I said, the signals need to be scaled as for the synaptic weights and passed on to the next layer. So essentially, it is a matrix vector multiply operation. And now this synaptic efficacy can be realized by exploiting the Ohm's law and the Kirchhoff's current summation law uh, without having to read back the individual conductance values or having to shell them around the processing unit. So that's very important, right? So the synaptic weights are fixed. Now, so this is all you need for inference. But now for training, uh, you also have to modify the synaptic weights. Uh, the synaptic weights need to be uh, nudged back and forth uh, in addition to the synaptic efficacy that you require. And that is where you use the accumulative behavior. The fact that you can apply pulses of the same amplitude over and over again to nudge the synaptic weights back and forth. And this is what you employ, um, uh, uh, what you need uh, to do training. So for training, the synaptic weights needs to be uh, you know, nudged back and forth as, as the network sees training examples. And this synaptic, efficacy, synaptic plasticity can be achieved by exploiting the accumulation behavior, uh, again, in place in the memory array itself. Because at, at, at no point are, are we reading back the conductance values and, it, and taking a decision based on that. It's all happening in place. So I hope uh, uh, it's it's fairly clear what's going on here, and this is kind of the essence of how you would use the the physics of uh, phase change memory devices uh, to perform uh, deep learning, both inference and and, and training. Let's now go a bit more into detail. Um, so, or in more, a bit more detail in, in into the uh, inference, for example. Let's assume that uh, you know we have a neural network. So you know what we do is you know we train the neural network. It's presumably trained uh, in software. Um, then um, the synaptic weights that are obtained from the training procedure uh, are then mapped onto the conductance values of an array of um, cores where the PCM devices are organized in a crossbar configuration as shown here. Then each uh, core will now perform the matrix vector multiply operations corresponding to each layer and pass it onto the next layer and so on and so forth. So that's what it happens, right? So it's, it's a very, very simple illustration of how a multilayer perceptron is implemented using a, an array of uh, such uh, in-memory compute cores. Um, now, see, the biggest question mark when you're implementing these kind of neural networks is, uh, does it work? Because these devices, uh, you know, when you compute with them, they have very limited precision, and we always run into uh, problems of inaccuracy associated with the matrix vector multiply operations. Uh, so this is something that um, uh, we verified experimentally using phase change memory devices, in this case fabricated in the 19 nanometer CMOS technology. Uh, now the synaptic weights, as I said, were pre-trained in software and they were mapped onto the, the phase change memory conductance values. Um, uh, so this is a, a demonstration of the classification accuracy um, as a function of time for the so-called ResNet32 network on the SIFA 10 data set. Um, and so these blue points are the real experimental measurements obtained uh, on hardware and the, and the dashed line is the software baseline, right? What you would expect. And it can be seen that we could uh, maintain very high classification accuracies 
uh, you know, well above 93.5%, um, uh, even though we were performing uh, the computations in an analog way using this very noisy devices. So this gave us a lot of confidence that, that this concept works. But having said that, uh, you know, it doesn't work just out of the bat. You cannot just train the, the weights and then uh, map them onto these devices. You have to do some clever training procedure. And that is something that is described in great detail in this paper that we published last year. So you have you need to have a custom training approach, but it's all done in software. You map the weights onto the, onto the hardware and then, then it works uh, beautifully. Um, uh, even for training, um, actually, there is it's a bit more involved technique. It's called mixed precision in memory computing. Uh, we can achieve um, software equivalent accuracies, um, uh, and uh, so this is the essential idea is that in, in the, when you do training, you map the synaptic weights, or you map the or you uh, initialize the PCM devices into a random conductance value, and as you're seeing the rain, the the training examples, uh, you nudge the conductance values back and forth by applying these accumulation pulses. Uh, and once you train that network, then uh, the network can continue to inference. Um, and so this is something that, that we do. So again, you know, we start with a random distribution of PCM conductance values. You nudge them back and forth by exploiting now the slicization dynamics or the accumulation behavior. And eventually, they settle down to this uh, optimal uh, synaptic values that, that, you, that you want. Uh, this approach is also uh, described in great detail in this particular paper, uh, which was published uh, last year. And also, uh, one of these uh, networks, uh, you know, which were trained in this particular manner is available via cloud. So you can actually run the experiment um, on this chip, which is uh, in, in IBM Zurich via the cloud. So if you go to this link, you can try out uh, the chip uh, by your own and convince yourself that some of these concepts uh, do work. Um, right, so uh, let's now go into a bit more into the, the system level aspects, uh, right? So how does now an accelerator based on in-memory computing look like? Uh, so it would have uh, a number of in-memory computing cores interconnected by a communication fabric. Uh, it is a genuine uh, data flow architecture, right? Because the synaptic weights are uh, stationary and the activation signals are, are propagated through the chip. So you can think of like each in-memory computer core performing a matrix vector multiply operation, passing on the result to the next core and so on and so forth. Uh, so hence, compared to a conventional uh, digital accelerator, uh, this kind of a IMC or in-memory computing based accelerator is, is amenable to highly uh, spatially pipeline data flows uh, with a potential to achieve unprecedented latency and throughput. Uh, because you know, you can, uh, each of these compute cores will be uh, potentially running uh, multiple, you know, different layers at the same time. And that way you can have a uh, remarkably high, uh, high throughput. Uh, in fact, some of these calculations were worked out for a, a range of networks. And if you look at uh, these papers from, from Martino, uh, you would get an idea as to what kind of performance we can expect uh, from this kind of an uh, end-to-end -end performance we can expect from this kind of an accelerator. Um, and also in this year's uh, VLSI, uh, we actually had a highlight paper where we presented one of the uh, in-memory compute cores. You know, I, I mentioned like you know, the, each one of them is a compute core here, right? So we, we presented one of them at VLSI. Uh, so it was a 200, 200, 256 by 256 array of uh, synaptic weights. Um, each synaptic weight comprising uh, four phase change memory devices. Uh, this represents a signed weight. Uh, of course, it has all the ADCs and also a little bit of digital processing incorporated into the same uh, core. Um, and uh, yeah, and you can see that, you know, uh, we, uh, I mean, it works beautifully. So these are all the conductance values that you can program them to. It's actually an analog storage device, but it's just uh, 16 representative uh, samples shown here. Uh, we also performed the matrix vector multiply operation and the precision is comparable to like a four bit um, fixed point arithmetic. Uh, having said that, the accumulation is in high precision. So it's kind of a hypothetical uh, four bit fixed point arithmetic where you're performing uh, each of the scalar multiplication uh, with four bit precision, but then you're accumulating in, in full precision. Uh, and if you look at the matrix vector multiply operation performance, uh, we are getting a pretty impressive 10.5 tops per watt and 16.5 tops per watt per millimeter squared. So this kind of the numbers uh, that we achieved and what we showed at, at, at VLSI. 
Um, so now, uh, you know, you would say, okay, the numbers are impressive for a first of its kind, but, uh, you know, you would say, okay, it is not mind blowing yet, you know, you could potentially reach there with, um, you know, very advanced scaling, you know, if you go to seven nanometers or five nanometer, then potentially we might reach these kind of numbers. So what's the big deal, right? Uh, I mean, uh, I would say that this is not the end of the end of the story, right? So this is what we showed at VLSI. So this is the, the dimension, uh, 0.8 millimeter by 0.8 millimeter, and the integration time, this is a computational time, right? 130 nanoseconds uh, array dimensions and this is the specs that I that I just talked to you about uh, but assume that we can now make this 0.8 mm by 0.8 mm to 0.2 mm by 0.2 mm which is very reasonable to do and if you can reduce the integration time to 15 nanosecond and increase the array size to 512 by 512 then immediately we start getting uh, much bigger numbers like 100 tops per watt and 261 uh, tops per millimeter square so it gets extremely interesting uh, this, I think, is well within the reach of you know, what we could do, probably just a bit of engineering effort. Uh, but one could also foresee uh, going even further down to 0.1 millimeter by 0.1 millimeter, um, 10 nanoseconds, 1024 by 1024 array. Uh, of course, this is also well within the realms of what a high density memory chip could look like. Uh, and there you can see now some of these astronomical numbers that would be, I would argue, would be almost impossible to achieve um, uh, in a conventional digital accelerator. And on top of it, uh, you know, you, you have the non-volatile weight storage, um, you know, the weight stationarity advantages, which I'm sure some of the previous speakers like Manan probably talked about, uh, where, you know, you have these added advantages, right, in addition to having very impressive uh, performance, uh, computational performance numbers. Yeah, so that's kind of the, the promise of, you know, where we go, where we are and, and where we could go with this kind of technology. Um, so now, uh, other other natural question that you may have is, okay, you said that we have something like four bit precise uh, multiplication, uh, but is that sufficient? I mean, can, is there any uh, chance we could go higher than four bit using analog computation? In fact, uh, uh, it is indeed possible. There are very interesting device concepts which we are uh, pursuing. Uh, in my group, we have a very active research also on the physics of phase change memory devices and next generation phase change memory devices. And in fact, we had another highlight paper at IEDM a couple of years back where we proposed a concept called the projected memory. So it's a, I won't go into details of it. It's a slightly modified phase change memory device, uh, which is just an additional layer of material besides the phase change material. And with that particular type of device, we could actually show uh, that we could even do 8-bit precise uh, fixed point arithmetic, which would be a game changer. I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, uh, if you can achieve 8-bit uh, precise fixed point arithmetic, uh, and if you have the same amount of, uh, you know, compute density, then we would be far better than any digital uh, processor that could come along the way. So extremely interesting and very promising uh, approach. Um, in addition to that, uh, you probably already heard uh, from Harish's talk. I mean, I've been, we have been working with the Harish's group on uh, trying to also have uh, in-memory computing also done in the photonic domain. And, and, and one of the main uh, reasons for that is, you know, in my previous uh, outlook, I kind of said that the, the fastest integration time that you can probably get in the electronic domain is probably 10 nanoseconds. Uh, and that's kind of where probably the capacitance of the array and all that thing will kind of limit you. And even that is kind of aggressive, I would say. Uh, but uh, the advantage that if, you know, if you can make a photonic array using very similar concepts I'm sure Harish talked about, then we can actually have a photonic crossbar array, which is like an exact count part of the electrical crossbar array that I talked about. And, and on top of it, we'll be able to get this advantage of the very high modulation speed that you have in photonics, right? You can have 10 gigahertz, uh, anywhere north of 10 gigahertz in photonics. Uh, and this along with the wavelength division multiplexing, the fact that you can now encode on uh, multiple wavelengths means that we could have some truly remarkable uh, compute performance. Uh, yeah, so these are two, you know, kind of forward looking uh, technological advances. So one of them is a projected memory, which could possibly improve the compute precision and then uh, photonic in-memory computing, uh, which could actually uh, break the speed barrier, right? We can actually go way beyond the 10 nanosecond computational time that I talked about earlier. Right, so now let's move on to the, to the last and the third part of my talk, where uh, I would like to uh, kind of talk a bit about the applications beyond conventional deep learning. And I think it's extremely important, especially for the student uh, students who are on the call, because uh, you know deep learning acceleration is already kind of old story and there's a lot of work to be done there still, but I think we shouldn't uh, also take our eyes off some of the other very interesting things going on, uh, going on, you know, which might come down the, down the road. Uh, so let's just look at, uh, you know, 
how does the deep learning landscape look like, right? Um, so if you look at, uh, you know, the, you know, the rise of uh, deep learning uh, over the last decade has has surprised almost everyone. Arguably, even the most ardent believers in this approach, um, you know, the emergent behavior that arose from these very simple models of neurons and synapses uh, have kind of revolutionized fields such as uh, computer vision and, and and machine translation. Uh, so so deep learning per se, I would. I would argue would be the the de facto to go technology when it comes to uh, vision and and machine translation, um, but uh, but but what else? I mean, what what next, right? Um, uh, there is also a significant research on combining um, artificial neural networks with other uh, machine learning approaches, uh, such as you know uh, Monte Carlo tree search, reinforcement learning, symbolic AI. Uh, explicit associative memory that's what is shown here uh, etc so these are all so people have realized that okay deep learning uh, as a as a tool is very good for finding correlations it's a great function approximator but you may have to add something to it to to really do stuff right and in many instances this has significantly expanded the power of deep learning to realms where uh, we thought deep learning had uh, no hope of succeeding uh, so this is a a very interesting area we have to keep an eye there because this is kind of where we are going. I mean, people have found out, okay, this is what deep learning can do. Okay, now the question is, okay, what can I attach to deep learning to make it even more powerful and go towards something like a, a artificial general intelligence or, you know, or, you know, something, something along those lines. Now, another uh, key area of research is, you know, the more biologically plausible artificial neural networks, right? So there's always this promise of enhanced information processing capability by having additional neuronal and synaptic dynamics, temporal codes, etc. So this is again a very alive and well uh, field, right? Where people are trying to see, uh, you know, whether is there any benefit in having more biologically plausible uh, deep neural networks. Um, so I just want to uh, touch upon both of them a little bit and some of our recent work in these areas. Um, so if you look at the first part, right, deep neural networks um, uh, plus something else, right, plus something. Uh, and that's something that we have been looking at mostly is the is explicit memory. So the, the, the connectivity, uh, you know, as you know, if you look at a neural network, the connectivity in a neural network is some sort of implicit memory, right? It's some memory that you create during the training process. Um, uh, I would call it the implicit memory. Now, a traditional deep neural networks, they require enormous amounts of data to build up that implicit memory, as you know, right? You train on millions of data sets to finally arrive at that implicit memory memory. And this kind of makes it very difficult to relearn and adapt to new data when they come along. So this is why they are extremely difficult, uh, why, you know, why uh, deep neural networks don't learn like the way like a human baby learns, for example, right? We keep making that analogy. Um, now, uh, to, to overcome this, uh, one prominent idea uh, is to enhance such deep neural networks with an explicit memory now, uh, to which the neural network can read and write onto. Right, so this is kind of like a neural network talking to an explicit memory. Now, this kind of talking is so-called the soft read and write, and um, it's sort of like an associative memory search. And this is highly unsuited for conventional four neuron architectures because you have to touch every memory device in this explicit memory. So uh, this architecture has been shown to be very powerful. There have been many papers over the years, but from an implementation point of view, it's a nightmare because of the of the fact that you need to do these soft read and write operations into this explicit memory. Um, so what we recently did is we found a way to realize this explicit memory using uh, pseudo orthogonal high dimensional binary or bipolar vectors. So I mean, this is the so-called field of hyperdimensional computing where you compute based on large dimensional uh, binary or bipolar vectors, you know, dimensions in excess of uh, maybe 1000 or 10,000 even. Um, now, uh, we found that such, an, uh, such a high dimensional explicit memory uh, to be very useful for a uh, few short learning, uh, in particular learning from very few examples, we actually got a uh, like a record accuracy when it comes to few short learning. I would encourage you to go and look up this paper for more details on how that was done. Uh, I mean, but for the purpose of today's talk, the idea is that you want to have your explicit memory built out of these high dimensional vectors, right? And that would, uh, that would make things much nicer in many respects. I also want to put a teaser out there because if you can have this high dimensional uh, vector-based explicit memory, then you can also do higher level reasoning and some of these things. So it's, it's also this potential 
potential for that. Uh, again, there was this blog article that we wrote where we uh, wrote about some of these potential for this kind of an approach. But let's stick to the in-memory computing side of the thing. So uh, besides all the computational advantages that a high dimensional explicit memory would bring in, uh, another very nice advantage of this approach is that we can implement this soft attention mechanism, right? the soft read that mechanism that I talked about uh, all in memory. Um, so we could uh, facilitate a robust implementation of not just the deep neural network, but this something in this case, which is an explicit memory using in-memory computing. And um, uh, so we can essentially realize this very efficient associative memory search um, uh, using in-memory uh, dot product operations. So it's again a concept that we showed uh, last year sometime how we could do it, uh, but we also right now implemented it in this context of uh, a, a explicit memory attached to a neural network. So, uh, so the, the message I want to give is that uh, in-memory computing doesn't seem to be just confined to accelerating uh, deep neural networks per se. I mean, clearly you could have implemented uh, the deep neural network using the approach that I talked about earlier, but you can also try to accelerate some of the additional elements uh, of uh, such kind of emerging uh, you know, uh, forms of deep neural networks. Now coming to the uh, to the last part, right? Which is uh, so. So what about the more biologically plausible uh, deep neural networks? Um, um, so the, the fundamental question is, okay, you know, uh, okay, what is the key distinction and why would you even care uh, looking at uh, spike neural networks? So if you look at a conventional deep neural network, uh, you know, the neurons are static nonlinear functions, synapses are scalar multiply units, and the information is uh, transmitted as floating point numbers. But if you look at biological neural networks, uh, you immediately see that neurons and synapses are now dynamical entities. That's one of the biggest differences, right? So you have uh, you don't have this kind of static knowledge function of neurons, but we have some dynamics there. Similarly, for the synapses, they have their own uh, synaptic dynamics. In addition to that, information is encoded in terms of time and transmitted by spikes. So there's no floating point number involved in the case of uh, uh, spike neural networks, rather uh, the brain is computing uh, or spike neural networks are uh, computing based on time, right? Time is the compute variable. Um, but I mean, you can see that there are some similarities, but of course there are um, differences. And in, in my view, uh, a spike neural network is a kind of an extension of an artificial neural network. And what we found is that with this very simple um, artificial neural networks, we could get this emergent behavior and we could do like amazing things. Uh, but of course, a spike neural network can only add on to it, right? Because it is more powerful, because it has more, more, um, uh, you know, um, more dynamics into the whole system. Uh, and so the natural question okay, was, what are the potential benefits? I mean, you know, people are still uh, debating over this question. I mean, there are very interesting articles in particular, I would encourage you to look at uh, Michael Pfeiffer's article here where, you know, he talks about, okay, what are the, why would someone even work on SNNs, right? So what are the potential benefits? Um, uh, one of them is clearly due to the event-driven nature of, uh, of uh, spike neural networks, there could be a significant energy efficiency because you only compute uh, when there is a, a spike, right? Otherwise you don't compute. And that is very good for uh, sensors or whatnot, which are not always on. Um, and so we don't have to maintain a global clock and we only need to compute when triggered by the data, essentially. The second very interesting thing is, is the fact of temporal codes. This is actually a very interesting concept and might also be very interesting for image uh, sensing applications that, that Vasco was talking about. Because if you look at a conventional deep neural network, uh, you need to process frame by frame, right? You, you compute on a frame, the next, that frame data, you know, those representations go into the next layer of the neural network and so on and so forth. But in a spiking neural network, you can possibly have a single spike just cutting across the layers and getting you the decision. Right. So that uh, has the potential to have this very uh, low latency, which is something which many years back Simon Top had shown, uh, you know, by looking at the human visual cortex and, and explaining how fast you can sense objects, even though if you just compute layer by layer the computational time, it wouldn't add up. Right. So clearly a spike is kind of winning the race and then cutting across the layers and then giving you the, the, uh, the result. And finally, uh, um, and, and by, uh, yet another thing, of course, is a learning, right? I and mean, the training methodology, backpropagation, as you know, is computationally very intense. I mean, of course, in-memory computing could alleviate to some extent, but nothing can beat local event-based learning. So that could provide us a lot of energy efficiency if we could crack the code of how, could do, how we could do it. So there are a lot of unknowns here uh, as well. 
Now, the last part is synaptic dynamics. So as I said, in a conventional neural network, you have this fixed um, you know, weighting of, uh, of, it's a very static weighting of your signal, but what if you have some additional dynamics? Can we uh, make use of it, right? Can we do something useful with that? And that would kind of point towards a computational superiority. I mean, is there an AI task where having this additional synaptic dynamics can help you in some manner or not, right? That's the fundamental question. So regarding the last part, we try to answer it. Um, so the, uh, you know, using um, a, a very interesting demonstration. So so we we demonstrate we demonstrate that a spike neural network equipped with a short-term spike-dependent plasticity. Again, don't want to go into the details of what that is. It is a it is a short-term plasticity, but it is also spike-dependent. Um, uh, I'm not even trying to explain it in this very limited amount of time that we have, but uh, the whole idea is that I want to add this tiny amount of dynamics to the synapse, which is this short term component. Um, and uh, it was shown even theoretically that it can infer exceptionally well in dynamically changing environments. So as an example, let's look at a, uh, you know, like a, just a simple MNIST classification problem. It works, you know, if you, if you use conventional new, deep neural networks, it works amazingly well. Uh, but if you start now occluding that image as shown here with something, right, just covering it up, then of course, all the deep neural networks will start failing miserably. Um, but uh, what we showed is that if you can have a spiking neural network with this short-term STDP property, then that can deal with this remarkably well and could outperform several types of conventional deep neural networks, even those who are trained on the full training set, including the uh, uh, occlusion, right? So remember that the spiking neural network that, that we used, it was only trained on the image data set, whereas for example, the LSTM that it's used to compare against have, was trained on the, on the full uh, data set, which includes occlusion. It knows that an occlusion is happening. And even then the, the spiking neural network with this simple um, uh, STSTDP short-term plasticity uh, performs much better. So uh, I, I think uh, this is one of the first real demonstrations of a, of a tangible uh, example of a computational um, superiority arising from having this additional synaptic dynamics. Of course, there are also a few others, I'm sure, but this is one of the, uh, one of the foremost ones at least I've come across. Um, right. Uh, so this is just, uh, you know, uh, just to illustrate why it is still probably interesting to look at, uh, you know, uh, this additional synaptic dynamics in spiking neural networks. Uh, but now let's assume that spike neural networks were great and, and imagine that they are, uh, you know, they can do some amazing things, but even then running them on conventional uh, von Neumann uh, machines is a nightmare uh, just because of the nature in which they operate. You know, you need to implement all these dynamics, you need to implement, uh, you know, this time-based computing, time-based learning rules, all that stuff. Uh, so naturally it is, it is not not at all ideal for conventional form and machines. Um, uh, and hence there was, as you know, quite, a, quite some effort towards building special neuromorphic chips, uh, one of them being uh, IBM's True North, um, you know, and, 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 uh, and this was based on a digital CMOS technology. And then uh, for example, there are also analog uh, mixical approaches pursued mostly by the Institute of Neuroinformatics. This was kind of the old Carl Mead approach uh, where uh, we were trying to exploit the subthreshold mostly characteristics directly emulate neuronal and synaptic dynamics. So the, the message is that we definitely need some kind of SNN coprocessors. If at all, we have to implement spike neural networks in an efficient manner. So first you have to prove that SNNs are useful and if they are found to be useful, then you need uh, specialized hardware to implement them. Uh, that is where um, um, in-memory computing could also play a role. Uh, you know, there is, um, uh, you know, the, both the synaptic uh, efficacy and the plasticity can be realized uh, efficiently uh, yet again in physically instantiated synaptic arrays. And so here is a, a recent experimental demonstration where we did, where we mapped, uh, you know, audio signals uh, to, to images. Uh, the audio signal is passed through a, a silicon cochlear chip to generate the spike streams. And, you know, basically it's IBM. I think I was saying IBM here, and then you can see the IBM images here. Uh, but I, I must also point out that there is a tantalizing prospect now of implementing even more intricate synaptic dynamics uh, and update rules natively using device dynamics. Because that is probably where I think uh, the device uh, work can help a lot, right? Because assume that someone comes up with this amazing algorithm which relies on uh, you know, additional synaptic dynamics and local learning rules, then we might be uh, finding it very difficult to implement them even, even on the um, uh, neuromorphic coprocessors that are being developed currently. So it will be great if we can do that at the synaptic level uh, using devices. 
Right. So with that, I would like to uh, come to the summary of my talk. So uh, deep learning, um, you know, as you know, is a key driver for innovations in computing systems. I think it's a, it is here to stay. I mean, either either as deep learning or as variants of deep learning or deep learning with sensors or whatnot. I mean, you know, this is here to stay. stay. I think it's I think it's it's a it's a primary driver for innovations. Um, now, new forms of computing, such as in-memory computing, are, are being explored uh, to, um, to, to deal with the computational inefficiency problem with deep learning. Uh, attributes, such as synaptic efficacy and plasticity, can be implemented in memory uh, by exploiting the, the physical attributes of memory devices, such as uh, phase change memory. Uh, we can perform ISO accuracy, deep learning inference, and training uh, with in-memory computing. Uh, so I also showed some of the recently fabricated mixed signal IMC cores, and that kind of demonstrates the promise of this technology. Uh, there are concepts as projected memory and photonic in memory computing, which could uh, push the envelope even further and try to achieve some uh, truly remarkable performance down the road. Um, and uh, I would also argue that the in memory computing approach could uh, impact applications that transcend conventional deep neural networks, such as memory augmented neural networks and, and spiking neural networks. Um, I would like to acknowledge, I mean, uh, I mean, much of the work uh, was done by my team here in the in memory computing group uh, at IBM Research Zurich. Uh, but of course, we're also, uh, I also work very closely with um, the worldwide labs of IBM, uh, including the IBM AI Hardware Center. Um, you know, it's, it's a collaborative research hub, which is headquartered in, in Albany, New York. Uh, I would also like to thank the several academic partners that we have. Uh, also, the very generous uh, support that uh, I have from um, European and, and Swiss funding agencies. Uh, just one final slide uh, where I would like to also introduce um, um, you to this uh, you know, open source toolkit that we um, recently put out. Uh, it would be really great if you could uh, go there and you know try to contribute to that effort. I think it will really help advance these kind of new fields. Um, it would be great if you could write like a, an extension to that or you know add more functions to it. Um, that would be fantastic and that'd be a great uh, great thing to do. I hope it was uh, hopefully I could capture. Uh, uh, and a sense of what, what we are doing here in, in Zurich. Uh, thank you, Abu. I mean, <laughs> that was very insightful. Uh, so I think uh, we'll wait for some questions. Meanwhile, like, and I'll just put like a, a question that came uh, out of nowhere. So when, uh, when I was like uh, thinking about PCM, um, uh, um, I think I saw some works which were describing like organic PCMs and inorganic PCMs. Have you uh, ever had a chance to see that? Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, pretty much all the PCM that we work with um, is is you know is based is chalcogenides, right? So they're basically compounds of germanium, antimony, and tellurium. Um, uh, it could be that there are some organic materials which could also undergo phase transition, but uh, I mean, I have I'm not aware of anything which could under undergo phase transition at these speeds, right? Because the the, the key advantage of uh, phase change memory, or, or you know, this this class of material, this this triangle that I showed, right, um, is I mean that's what kind of also led to the optics revolution, right? I mean, or optical storage revolution is that they found this amazing material which could uh, switch uh, back and forth in less than 100 nanosecond, right. right, while being stable at room temperature for 10 years. So this is the difficulty. Right, so you have a material which can be stable at room temperature or at 85 degrees for 10 years, uh, but the moment you raise the temperature to 300 degrees Celsius or something, it can switch phase like in in 10 nanoseconds. So this was uh, something very unique, and even that kind of uh, that crystallization kinetics is still being very actively researched. And, and another thing is like with this toolkit, um, hmm. uh, how accurate are they uh, related to the devices? Um, right. So, so in the in the first version of the toolkit, uh, we are um, actually you know have very very good ha hardware calibrated models are, are 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 open source, so people can use it and try to you know do stuff with that. Uh, but soon enough, the plan is to also open up some of the hardware. So if people could like, you know, uh, develop some algorithms and they could run the algorithms in our hardware, right, via the cloud. Mm -hmm. uh, but already the models, I would say, are fairly accurate. So if typically if, if these uh, uh, algorithms work on the models, they usually work on the hardware eventually. Oh, this is Bhaskar here. Globally yes. speaking, uh, one of the things which academics look at, uh, which has helped CMOS process has been really accessibility to by the academic world through MPW runs. Yes, yes. When do you reckon something like PCM would be available for academics <laughs> to try making chips? I think it could be, right? Because, uh, I mean, one of the 
positive things about the consolidation of you know the foundry business right if you look at it uh, is that uh, i can really foresee like one of the big foundry players you know who i'm talking about there are only three of them right now right <laughs> so uh, after you guys walked out <laughs> <laughs> so i think i think it's very possible that you know one of the, i know for a fact that you know they all already provide them on a research basis right some of them but i can really see them opening up uh, you know pcm and re ram to some extent right um, as a foundry service so which could also democratize the whole process right so then you could try to uh, i mean there are two things two big shifts going on in the industry right one of them is the fact that you know the foundries may open up some of these uh, pdks and you could design on that and the second thing is um, the fact uh, the advances in 3d integration and uh, and and packaging right so which means that then you are kind of decoupled right you could you could have uh, two different foundry providers doing the stuff for you uh, yeah so i think i think i think a lot of things could change in the next couple of years because of these two dynamics which are evolving Uh, is, and alternatives, uh, of course, to collaborate with us. But... <laughs> <laughs> You're already collaborating with the guy who's staying in both my places, one next living next door, and now one living a one door above. <laughs> is it <laughs> Peter Haring? Is my next door? Peter, Peter, yeah, sure, sure, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So uh, there are a couple of questions, like you know, from the audience. Uh, can can the neural network be used as a mere memory during idle times? Uh, what is its memory efficiency based on normal memory metrics? Uh, yeah, you could. Uh, it is a very uh, not so smart way of using it, right? As a as a memory, because one of the things that uh, one of the main challenges of um, uh, or, or, you know one of the main challenges that we solved uh, during the whole you know I showed you this VLSI um, uh, work, right? That we recently showed. Um, is definitely the parallel activation of all these lines, correct? And in memory, uh, you almost never do that, right? You 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 are you have a very much simpler problem where you activate one word line, one bit line. Um, I mean, at least in, in, in this kind of uh, random access kind of uh, memory architectures. Um, whereas here, we are activating all the 256 lines, and we are uh, having uh, ADC per column. Right, ADC per column, uh, sampling all the 256 columns, and and this was a monumental effort to do that. Um, and uh, in a, in a way, if you use it as a pure memory, of course you're free to do that, but you're not really using the the full advantage of uh, you know that capability that you have built in there. I mean, there's nothing which prevents you from essentially a memory access is just a simplistic case of a one-hot encoded vector multiplication, isn't it? You're just doing a simplistic matrix vector multiply operation with a uh, with a one hot encoded vector so it's a it's a very limiting case of what you could do uh, with this chip but there's nothing which prevents you from that uh, but of course uh, which means that your mvm for example here we were able to measure do the full mvm in 130 nanoseconds so your memory access will also be 130 nanoseconds which is not ideal and uh, i think another there is one practical question uh, mm -hmm. Could you please comment on the conductance range of PCMs used in different size slices, like 256 by 256 or 1024 by 1024, etc.? And is there any right. kind of loading effects that you observe? Yeah, uh, I think it's always good to uh, have as resistive uh, memory as possible uh, because um, you would always want your memory device to be. Uh, uh, be the primary contributor and then not the interconnects, right? Uh, so it's always a, and that's one of the big advantages of PCM and um, resistive RAM over say, say MRAM because MRAM has uh, you know very low uh, resistance values over, overall. Um, uh, yeah, so, so, so it is always good to have, uh, you always try to push for the highest uh, resistance as possible, uh, but then of course the device physics will kick in at some point, right? And then you won't be able to, um, to get that. So I would say uh, like a mega ohm, a 10 mega ohm is kind of ideal. Um, if you have sufficient SNR, I would even push even more because unlike memory, you are not sensing at a single device level, but rather you're always accumulating the current. So you, you have an opportunity to go even higher. If you want, you can even go to a giga ohm, right? Uh, because you'll have sufficient current because you're integrating over thousands of devices. Uh, yeah, so this is something which in memory, you probably never do that. But in, in memory computing, I think there's a lot of incentive to go as high as possible. Uh, just out of curiosity, um, uh, is your ADC's like area smaller than that of the PCM area? 
Oh no, ADC is, uh, I mean, I think it's, um, you can kind of see it, right? So so you only have, I mean, we have 200, 256 by 256 uh, unit cells, mm -hmm. uh, whereas, you know, this blue area is all ADCs, right? Yeah, um, yeah. So, so it's definitely uh, bigger. Uh, and this is also one of the key research areas, right? How to make it mm -hmm. compact. Um, right, right. Uh, and, and 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 small, yeah. But having said that, the PCM here is also not that dense, right? Because we purposefully, I mean, first of all, we had a 40, uh, mm. sorry, 4 PCM, 40, then, uh, 4 PCM the... HR design, which was a an over, we overdid it because we just wanted redundancy, but it's not needed. You can actually have just two devices. Okay. So, okay. yeah. Uh, so there's another question. What would be the ideal method of distributing the data sets uh, according to the train validation and testing for SNL? Uh, oh, I, I think that would be, uh, I mean, it's, it's a very broad question, right? Yeah, yeah, to, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's very, okay. Uh, there was another one, um, which is the most accurate method for training SNN. Yeah, training SNNs is, uh, you know, uh, I mean, there are two ways in which you could, it, it depends, I mean, SNN again is a very uh, broad term, right? I mean, anything biologically plausible, uh, we club under uh, the umbrella of S SNN. So, uh, I mean, it, it's it's very difficult to put it under, under like, you know, one framework, but typically what people uh, mean by SNN is that they would um, try to convert, um, you know, all, they would try to avoid uh, all the floating point based information transfer and try to make it uh, spike trains, right? So you, that is one thing that they typically do. And the other thing is to have an integrate and fire neuron with some diagram dynamics instead of just having a static nonlinear function as what you have in AMU. So this is what the, the simplest SNN that people typically refer to. Uh, and if you if you want to do that, there are essentially two approaches. So one of them is you, you train a deep neural network and then you just convert it into a spike neural network. Uh, and this is the most, uh, uh, I mean, prominent approach. And this is what people have kind of made it to work. Now there are enough uh, tools and approaches there to do that, right? So you could take a deep neural network and you can convert it into an equivalent spiking neural network. But you cannot expect to have any computational benefit from that. You have to understand that upfront, right? Because you are just taking a spike, uh, deep neural network and you're converting it to spiking neural network. Uh, so the, the only thing you can benefit is potentially some energy efficiency, assuming the input signal is sufficiently sparse, right? Uh, so this is doable. But any other kind of thing like online learning is still a very active area of research. There are ideas like EPROP and whatnot and all these ideas come there as, as backprop uh, alternatives, which are still not there yet. I mean, it is still very difficult to train a deep spike neural network um, using any of those uh, real time uh, or rather in situ training approaches. Uh, <clears throat> so we have to be very mindful of you know what we are doing when we are doing spiking your network. We should have a clear mind as to what we aim to achieve with that. If our only objective is to achieve energy efficiency because of the sparsity of the information that is coming in, then I think we are there because we can train a deep neural network and make it spiking and do that, right? But if our objective is to kind of get a computational benefit out of it, uh, then you definitely have to add other um, synaptic dynamics and whatnot, like what I mentioned. So we cannot expect that to come from the former approach. And, and uh, just a practical question: What, what is the maximum like number of layers that you manage to do with um, SNN on PCM? Um, SNN and not really much because uh, I mean even this uh, supervised learning task that we did um, uh, is is I believe uh, it was just a uh, just a single layer, right? Or, or maybe two layers max because you can have a fixed uh, layer up front. Uh, but yeah, in the SNN domain, uh, not really. Uh, but in the ANNs, yes, we could we could go much deeper. Like the rest of 32 was uh, 34 layers, right? The experiment that was done. Uh, but but in SNNs, as I said, you know, if, if your objective is just to train the SNN, um, I mean, train and or convert an ANN to SNN, I don't see any reason why we cannot do it, right? right. It's just that it won't be as accurate as the ANN. So. Then yeah, and, and and the, the, there are some groups which uh, basically what they do is they try to combine like the spiking with like uh, uh, dense layers. So yeah, you could possibly do that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But but my, my but my point is that uh, Alex is that if you are not going to use the temporal uh, coding or right. if you are not going to use the dynamics, then SNN will only be beneficial if the data is sparse. Right. right, right. Uh, otherwise, you could, you might as well do, if you have a dense data coming, if you're doing image classification, why would you do SNNs? I mean, right. I don't see any reason why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You agree. <laughs> <laughs>
So I, I think we'll leave uh, with that thought. Um, and and if if uh, if someone has like more questions, they they could post that into the chat, and we'll take it up.